This is not a good movie. The world is great, it makes me mad, but at least I get to talk about it with Jose. On January 4th, right-wing news commentary website, The Daily Wire, announced it had purchased the distribution rights to the movie Run, Hide, Fight, a movie that is often described as Die Hard set in a school shooting. The movie is part of the Daily Wire's attempt to move into the world of entertainment, according to an article written by one of the Daily Wire co-founders, Ben Shapiro. We're going to be bringing out movies. Edgy, entertaining, awesome movies that won't mock your values. We're going to be producing TV shows, comedies and dramas that take you seriously and that don't take advantage of your viewership to promote leftist causes. The Daily Wire is currently developing one feature and two TV series, though no specific details about those have been announced. Part of Lee Madly desperately hopes they're adapting the works of Ben Shapiro for the screen. Sadly, Run, Hide, Fight was not inspired by the written works of Ben Shapiro. In fact, this film was produced completely independently of The Daily Wire's new initiative, and their only attachment to Run, Hide, Fight is to be its distributor. There are no grim Bret Hawthorne-esque heroes or drug dealers posing as civil rights activists. Instead, we have a simpler story of a teenage girl who has to gun down her classmates after they try to shoot up their school. An action movie using a school shooting as a backdrop doesn't scream leftist values, so I can see why they chose this as their first film to distribute. The article also echoes an important lesson learned from Andrew Breitbart, who Shapiro calls his mentor, the idea of politics being downstream from culture. This move into the entertainment industry is, according to Shapiro, about fighting back against the left, who supposedly dominate the major institutions of the entertainment industry. According to Jeremy Boring, co-CEO of The Daily Wire, this is a gut-wrenching film that refuses to offer easy talking points, which is why liberal Hollywood executives have refused to distribute it. The trailer had a very strong reaction on YouTube, with nearly 1.5 million views within its first two weeks of going up. The movie takes its name from a survival tactic recommended to people in instructing them on how to survive a mass shooting incident. This weird, cheesy training video is on YouTube and has over 9 million views. Run, Hide, Fight made its North American debut on January 14th, in a streaming event hosted on the Daily Wire website and YouTube. According to Boring, the stream had over 70,000 viewers. But the more important question, how was the movie? The plot is very easily summarized. High school senior Zoe Hull, played by Isabel May, is disengaging from her life following the recent passing of her mother. Upon going to school, her day is interrupted by the arrival of four school shooters who take some of their classmates hostage in the cafeteria. The shooters livestream the hostage situation while Zoe first runs, hides, and then fights. She takes out each of the three cronies before killing their ringleader in the movie's final moments. Not exactly a plot filled with surprising twists and turns, and one completely predictable for anyone who saw the trailer. In spite of the subject material, this is a movie that very safely follows the action movie formulas. School shootings are indeed a rare topic in films. There are several of them out there, such as Elephant, We Need to Talk About Kevin, Polytechnique, and a handful of others. They often take artistic approaches you don't typically see in mainstream movies. The very real horror of a school shooting seems to demand filmmakers use unorthodox methods to broach the subject. Or maybe it's just a subject that attracts filmmakers whose talents don't neatly fit into the mainstream mold. But this is not one of those movies. Throughout its run, Run, Hide, Fight feels like a popcorn movie, which is a strange experience considering the subject matter. It seems to be asking the audience to compartmentalize the very real tragedy of a school shooting, put all that baggage aside, and watch the movie as a form of entertainment. The idea of ignoring the tragedy of a school shooting, at least insofar in wanting to discuss it politically, is often a project of the right. Whenever a school shooting happens, conversations about gun control are immediately silenced, and at best you might get some token discussion about mental health. Discussion that isn't terribly helpful, considering most mental health conditions don't result in school shootings. In fact, the vast majority don't. What we're more likely to hear are refrains about not wanting to disrespect the victims by politicizing a tragedy. In other words, don't consider any potential political action that might reduce the possibility of future school shootings. With that in mind, it's unsurprising that a conservative audience might be more capable of compartmentalizing a phenomena that right-wing media rarely critically examines. School shootings are something to be prepared for, but are also something that we're supposedly unable to actively prevent. Movies like this seem to be suggesting that school shootings, a rarity outside of the last few decades, are now part of the new normal. So we might as well make some action movies about them. This movie has a hero, Zoe Hall, which is a rarity for movies about school shootings. 
After all, if the purpose of the film is to explore the tragedy, a hero who prevents said tragedy seems counterproductive. In this case, the movie tries to have it both ways, featuring a number of students getting killed at the beginning of the hostage situation. Also, unlike other movies about school shootings, in the opening scene of the movie, the impending school shooting is foreshadowed with heavy-handed dialogue. We're gonna record an EP this summer. No way. Yeah, give the dream a shot before reality kicks me in the cooch. Nice. Jump cut scares. Okay and two different explosions. This is not a subtle film. Zoe is one of those strange leading characters who happens to be the only one in the movie with functioning eyes and notices something is slightly off during the day, such as the smoke from an explosion moving across the sky. Strangely though, Zoe completely misses the beginning of the school shooting. It unfolds with the quartet of shooters crashing their van into the cafeteria and firing off a machine gun. Zoe, who's in the cafeteria washroom, can't hear any of this over what must be the loudest hand dryer in the history of mankind. And no one else in the school hears it either. Classes go about normally. While I can't speak to the structure of high schools in rural Nebraska, I have to imagine someone would hear a van smashing into the cafeteria and the machine gun fire that followed. We then meet the villains of the movie. Their leader, Tristan, played by Eli Brown, is instantly unlikable as he acts like a cheesy action movie villain. I suppose we're meant to hate him, but I just wanted him off my screen. Tristan has a master plan to shoot up the school. You see, those explosions earlier were planted by him and his pals to distract the cops. They then disable the school's internal systems, arrange a live stream, and plant even more explosives around the school. These are surprisingly competent school shooters. If this nefarious plot sounds a little familiar to you, it's probably because Tristan also happens to be the Joker. His scheming is very similar to the Joker's in The Dark Knight, who plows a bus into a bank, has his minions disrupt the building's internal systems, and disguises himself as one of his victims to escape. There's also an echo of the classic Joker, with one of Tristan's followers being this goth-like Harley Quinn figure, Anna, played by Catherine Davis. And if you look closely, Tristan's gait kind of looks like the one Keith Ledger is doing in The Dark Knight. To be fair though, if someone did try to shoot up a school, I wouldn't be surprised if they thought of themselves as the Joker too. I would have guessed the Joaquin Phoenix version. Tristan's motivations are a bit less interesting than the Joker's though. He wants to be famous. On social media. And instead of starting a YouTube channel where he complains about women in Star Wars, he's decided to create the definitive school shooting. Okay, everybody watching is culpable. You all post and you tweet and you share. And everybody jumps at the chance to be both judge and jury, but in that system... Sheriff, you created a job opening. An executioner. You created me. And what does it for you? Uh, being definitive and creating the ultimate version of something. The only interesting thing about Tristan is that, secretly, I think he's a conservative. Here are a few telltale lines of dialogue. We had a cheesy joke about trigger warnings. Trigger warning. <laughs> He laughs at how inept school security is without a gun. As if it's not sad enough that they're only paying him $12 an hour to protect our school, they expect you to do it without a gun? And we get this little nugget to seal it. It's not that hard to build a wall. Looking at the film's protagonist and her love interest, Lewis, played by Holly Shulleton, I can't help but think that if this movie hadn't been distributed by The Daily Wire, we'd be hearing cries of Mary Sue and forced diversity. We'd probably hear some anger over all the villains being white, too. That is, if anyone would care about this movie to begin with. Going back to the school shooters, though, each of them is surprisingly uninteresting. Anna is Tristan's girlfriend, and that sums up her whole character. Oh, and she smokes weed, I guess that's another thing. This is for stealing all my weed. Then we have Kip, played by Cyrus Arnold, who fell under Tristan's sway because someone pulled his pants down in front of the whole school a couple of years ago. Kip has a baffling redemption arc where a two-minute talk from Zoe leads him to betraying Tristan. He still ends up dying, though, albeit so he can buy Zoe a few moments to escape a tight spot. Most tragic, though, is Chris, played by Britton Sear. He's Anna's brother, and apparently also romantically involved with Tristan. I'm not sure how the dynamics of this relationship work, but more importantly, Chris has some kind of severe mental health condition. The movie never says what exactly, though it seems like schizophrenia. He's one of those characters who's less a character and more just a collection of walking symptoms, and it makes him an easy tool to be used by Tristan. 
until he's eventually shot by Zoe's father, played by Thomas Jane. He was hanging around outside the school with a sniper rifle, because that's what army dads do, I guess. Chris is easily one of the worst depictions of someone with a mental health condition I've seen in quite a while. You might notice that all the antagonists are paper thin, with weak or no motivations at all. That's because a big part of this movie's intent, according to the writer-director Kyle Rankin, was to not glamorize the shooter. The fact that this movie could only shift the focus away from the shooter by creating a completely artificial scenario that let a hero step in speaks to how removed from reality this whole movie is. Which is especially ironic because many of the positive reviews I've read for this movie, and even comments in post-movie discussion, highlight the realism of it. One of Zoe's early encounters with one of the shooters is when Anna gets the drop on her as Zoe is trying to warn classrooms about the shooting in the cafeteria. Zoe is shot in the leg, but still somehow manages to get the drop on Anna, turning her own gun on her. The movie keeps going for a good 40 minutes after Zoe has been shot as she runs around the school, takes down the other shooters, and saves her classmates. A teacher at one point, instead of telling her student, who has a gunshot wound by the way, to get to safety and maybe get medical attention, instead goes with her on her mission. Somehow this is meant to be realistic. I think more likely the conservative audience, obviously curated from the Daily Wire readers, are seeing a version of reality they would rather was true, instead of the more tragic reality of what happens at an actual school shooting. But what I found most objectionable, the part where this movie fully devolves into psycho territory, happens in its final minutes. It's a callback to the opening scene where we can see Zoe and her father hunting a deer. The deer is mortally wounded, but not killed, and as Thomas Jane delivers a monologue about putting an animal out of its misery, Zoe smashes a rock on the deer's head to reveal she is a troubled person, still dealing with the recent death of her mother. In the final moments of the movie, we find out Tristan has given the cops the slip, and is slowly sneaking away from the scene of the crime. Even though dozens of kids have seen his face, and his only disguise is an orange baseball cap, he nearly makes it out. It's only Zoe who spots him. Instead of telling the cops about it, she grabs her dad's rifle, stalks Tristan, and then shoots him like a wild animal. As he bleeds out, she walks towards him, repeating her father's monologue from the first scene about putting an animal out of its misery, but instead of smashing the rock on Tristan's head, And it just isn't right to let it suffer. <laughs> Zoe's transformation in this movie is to go from troubled teen in mourning, pulling away from life, to the hero fully engaged with life, who also happens to enjoy watching villains suffering a miserable death. There's something disturbing and sadistic about an ending like this. In the hands of a more competent filmmaker, the ending could have highlighted how even being a hero in a school shooting creates a trauma that shatters all the good and compassion out of a person. The ending would be tragic, even if it seemed like justice, but in this film, Zoe's path is presented as righteous, and her growth is framed as something to be celebrated. She's letting go of the pain of losing her mother, and finding a reason to live in helping people. But no one was helped in this final scene. It was her needlessly doling out her own brand of justice. Much like the death of Kip, who was on the path to redemption, the movie seems to be operating under the idea that committing these crimes requires a swift punishment. In this case, a death sentence. It certainly falls in line with an earlier scene where a religious student, who only speaks in the scene, has a moment with Tristan. Free will. God allows the wicked to do their wickedness. Oh yeah, why's that? So they can be judged. Tristan's death is supposed to be viewed as an act of justice, but to me it only reads tragically. This movie, for all its errors of being popcorn entertainment, with vague allusions to heroism in the face of tragedy, can't escape the sad truth that, even in some kind of absurd power fantasy, a school shooting will still end in tragedy, and the movie's veneer of justice being served reveals a shallow excuse for how tragedies scar the survivors. If this movie had been deliberately moving to this ending on that sour downbeat note, it might have won me over. But as it is, this feels like my reading attempting to salvage what is otherwise a completely forgettable movie. On the night of its North American premiere, after the movie screened, there was a short discussion with one of the movie's producers, Dallas Saunier, and the movie's writer and director, Kyle Rankin. While watching the movie, one thing that was incredibly apparent was how shallow the motivations were for the shooters. In this conversation, we find out that's what drew Ben Shapiro to the movie in the first place. We need to treat them for the villains they are. It can't be all about 
you know, their, their tough yeah. childhoods, as you were suggesting, or the, the sort of crippling circumstances they went through. Look how tough life is for them. The, the, the actually, focus in this film is really on the victims. It yeah. really, really is on the victim. It's weird to hear that because the focus isn't really on the victims at all. Most of the victims are faceless students we never even learn the names of. If we compare this movie to one of the earlier movies about school shootings, Gus Van Sant's 2003 movie Elephant, we see a dramatically different depiction of a school shooting. While both films take place during a single day, Elephant spends time with over 10 different students, and most of that time is spent with students who are victims. My favorite example is the character Michelle. There's something so incredibly sad about her scenes. A quiet young girl who often fades into the background. We don't see her do anything but go about her day, keeping her head down while trying to get by. There's one scene where two characters, John and Elias, meet in an empty hallway and Elias takes a picture of John. Since the movie jumps around in the timeline of events of the day, we see this scene three times. First from John's perspective, then Elias's, and then finally from Michelle's. In the first two scenes, even though we've been introduced to Michelle already, we don't even notice she appears in this moment until the focus shifts in that third scene. It emphasizes that this is a character we don't see until we're directed towards her. The only time in the movie someone sees Michelle pulling her face from the crowd is in the library where she's helping out. The person who sees her is one of the school shooters, and we find out she's the first victim of the day. Even though we know very little about the character, the fact that we know so little reveals how little attention we pay to the inner lives of teenagers in general. The movie is making us consider that fact and how it might lead to people like the shooters, and perhaps more importantly, to value the quiet people around who we sadly let fade into the background unless they become the face of a tragedy. We'll never know what kindness or compassion or beauty might have been within a character like Michelle, and thanks to the shooters, we never will. The moment where Michelle is killed contains so much more tragedy and heartbreak than the first teen killed in Run, Hide, Fight. The first teen killed in Run, Hide, Fight is right here, under the tire of the van. Well, it's never really explained why the kid crawled under the van. As we can see clearly in the previous shot, the van didn't run over anybody. We don't know his name, or the name of the girl who shot right after him, or this guy who stabbed next. They just die in an effort to raise the stakes. This is a movie that focuses on some of the victims, but clearly not all victims are considered equal. The ones who fight back were remembered. Those who don't, who might have died a death like Michelle, are destined to be forgotten. The Daily Wire crew also wants to highlight how honest this movie is in its depiction of the shooters. It has a more honest take on, on the people who perpetrate, perpetrate these crimes than uh, most even news articles or, or documentaries that you see. It's trivially easy to explain how other movies that depict school shootings provide more thoughtful depictions of the shooters. I could highlight, for instance, Ilmar Rag's 2007 movie Class, where a bully befriends his victim and their friendship fuels school hostilities, leading them to murder their classmates. Or I could talk about Matthew Johnson's 2013 movie The Dirties, where a teenage boy's outsider status and obsession with movies detach him from reality, eventually leading to tragedy. Movies like these two make genuine attempts to examine the psychology of school shooters and the impact alienation from their peer group has on them. Run, Hide, Fight gives us very little in the way of backstory for any of the students, aside from Kip, and in that case, it's used in a conversation that can redeem. If anything, the film deliberately avoids this type of depth for its characters to prevent the audience from feeling any sympathy for them. Boring and Shapiro actually hit it on the head when they say this. You really took kind of an unflinching look at, at the evil that you were the saying, evil. yeah. With regard to the shooters, this movie is trying to display the evil they represent as something inherent and not the product of circumstances. Again, echoing the statements of the religious character earlier on, evil actions are permitted by God so that the evildoers can be judged. What made them evil to begin with is never considered. This reminds me very much of a comment made during the 2008 American election. The candidates at the time were Barack Obama and John McCain, and they were both asked about evil. Obama gave a long-winded response about understanding evil, the actions we take to confront it, and how trying to stop what we consider evil can have consequences we would also consider evil. It's kind of convoluted, you can read it here if you're curious. John McCain's response, though, was much more terse. His response to what should be done about evil was to say, defeat it. I think this represents two fundamentally different ways of looking at the concept of evil. When the label is applied to a person, Ben Shapiro, the rest of the Daily Wire crew, and the movie Run, Hide, Fight clearly fall into the latter camp. 
School shooters aren't meant to be something that can be understood or considered through art, rather they present the opportunity for a simple morality tale of good triumphing over evil. One especially revealing part of the discussions that preceded and followed the premiere is the victims the Daily Wire crew is most concerned with, conservatives. They'll still let you watch their movies, of course, their TV shows, their news, their sports, but you'll have to do it knowing that everyone who made that content, at least everyone at the top, hates you. Replacement institutions for all the institutions that hate our guts. The left obviously wants to silence and remove voices that they don't agree with. And there are artists on left and right with talent who can express those visions, but we're not allowed. We've been, as conservatives, progressively locked out of every single institution, every single one. This project to bring movies to their audience is fueled by the same victimhood mentality that runs through all their work. The left controls everything and hates the right with a burning passion. Of the five people representing The Daily Wire, Jeremy Boring, Andrew Clavin, Michael Knowles, and Ben Shapiro all have unremarkable careers trying to make it in the entertainment business. They are also convinced that the reasons they didn't make it is because conservatives are forbidden into the halls of Hollywood. While we could play the silly game of counting big conservative stars, such as Clint Eastwood, it's probably better to look at the creative writing of Ben Shapiro and let that speak to why he, and possibly his buddies, didn't make it too far in the world of Hollywood. With the knowledge of their creative limitations and some obvious bitterness in their critique, this whole endeavor has a different look to it. It seems less about providing entertainment to an underserved audience, but rather an attempt to vindicate their own anger at the world of Hollywood, fighting back with their own movies created by conservatives. It very much has a we'll show them vibe to it. Although Kyle Rankin is vague about his political beliefs, his producer, Dallas Saunier, is less cagey about it. I stayed the same. The world went left, yeah. right? I stayed here. And so I'm simply making the movies that I grew up loving. And when describing the movie, they seem fairly comfortable with it becoming embraced by a conservative audience. If the marketplace or the audience determines that the movie is more conservative in its values or matrix uh, or DNA, then so be it. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's, that's fine with me. And there's an attempt to frame this movie as enjoyable by a wider audience that presumably doesn't just include conservatives. If so, it makes me wonder why the only way to see this movie is to become a member on the Daily Wire website, where you would have to pay $14 a month to watch it. You also get access to some other Daily Wire content, but unless you're a fan of conservative media, and likely a conservative yourself, there isn't much value in that monthly fee. One thing it does do, though, is ensure that the audience for Run, Hide, Fight will be primed to enjoy it. And not simply because they enjoy its quality, but because it's part of a grander project of fighting back in the culture against the left. Entertainment that you can not only enjoy, but be proud of, knowing that you helped change the culture. And ultimately, that's the key. It also means the audience who determine the ratings on Rotten Tomatoes and IMDb are only coming from a conservative audience who have been primed to enjoy the movie and likely may be inflated. And negative reviews of the movie, well, those are brushed off as being product of the extreme left. The voices on the extreme left have not been open to the movie. In fact, they've, they've been um, almost resistant to it. Uh, in, in reviewing, when they review it, I, I don't want to ever single out an individual review because I don't like it when, when, when filmmakers do that, but I saw a systemic uh, sort of system in the reviews where it felt very much like a concerted effort to sort of review the subject matter and, and perceived mm -hmm. politics rather than the actual yeah. movie. I can understand the assumption that once The Daily Wire became involved, the way critics look at this movie would be altered. Heck, I wouldn't be reviewing this movie at all had I not read the story about The Daily Wire's connection to it. But to brush off negative criticisms as coming from the extreme left, who are ignoring the quality of the movie, is absolutely not true. I read every single review of this movie when it premiered at the Venice Film Festival in September of 2020. That's right, I read all seven of them. Of those seven, six were negative. Jessica Kiang wrote, At literally no point in this weirdly lumbering, sluggish movie's narrative does its grotesque tastelessness ever appear to have occurred to anyone involved. David Ehrlich wrote, It's a movie made by someone who's seen too many movies and now made at least one too many as well. And from Guy Lodge, what would you do? The film tastelessly needles its viewers throughout, presenting the brawniest, most impossible answer all the while. 
These reviews do make note of the subject matter, because how could you not, but only in the context of how the film depicts it. The one positive review came from Christian Toto. If there is a message here, it's an honest, unblinking one. Some children are broken as they near adulthood, a tragic lesson we've learned from real-life headlines. Question as to why those children are broken, though, is for superior movies. This one just wants us to celebrate another child murdering them. There's a Hunger Games vibe here. It's not just that Isabel May looks a bit like Jennifer Lawrence. It's that we in the audience are very much like the detached rich elites who watch teenagers kill each other. At least we aren't doing it for real. We're doing it in movies inspired by real-life events. In a brief behind-the-scenes documentary for the movie, many of the cast members shared their opinions that this movie might be positively read as a call to action. Not for any sort of political action, of course. Instead, it's to possibly inspire someone who might face a similar situation to fight back. If we become more proactive, and it does take a little bit of bravery, it doesn't mean you can't be scared shitless. But to act proactively um, is going to save lives. That's a recommendation that's so depressing. I can only hope they were desperately trying to find something constructive to say and hadn't had more than a few moments to think about it. To be clear, I bear no ill will to any actor or even some of the crew who were involved in the making of this movie. Everyone's got to earn a living somehow, and sometimes you sign up for a movie not necessarily knowing how it's going to turn out. One particular plot point, or lack thereof, was an explanation as to where these teenagers got a hold of so many guns. They had two pistols, a shotgun, and a machine gun. The machine gun is an MP40, which is what the Germans used during World War II, a not-so-subtle reminder that these are the bad guys. The absence of any explanation for where these guns came from seems to me like an absolute refusal to even speak to the gun culture of the United States. Everyone has guns, even relics from World War II. This is just a fact of life. And the idea that teenagers who want to shoot up a school, perhaps, just perhaps, shouldn't be able to put together a cache of weapons is never really explored. The idea that there might be a problem with the gun culture of the United States is just one more thing this film does not want us thinking about. It's ironic hearing the writer, director, or producer, anyone involved with this movie, talking about wanting to start a conversation or dialogue when this film seems entirely uninterested in presenting even the most basic starting point for a discussion. It was probably best summed up by, of all people, Matt Walsh, when following the screening, he said this. First of all, it's escapism. So it's a, it's a movie that you watch and it's just entertaining and you feel like you're in it and uh, you forget that you're watching a movie, which is what supposed, movies are supposed to be, but so often they're not these days. The idea of a school shooting being fodder for escapism is a creepy thought. It makes something that should be upsetting by the nature of its rarity seem commonplace and regular and normal. It does nothing to even broach the hard questions of why school shootings happen. Presenting them as something we should turn our brains off for. It does make heroes out of the victims, though only those who stand and fight against their fellow classmates. It's an ugly burden to put on teenagers, and one made especially ugly by the movie's embrace of national tragedies. What we have is a movie that exploits a tragedy to make a cheesy action film, and it doesn't really do much more than that. Okay, I need to stop the video right here, right now, for a content warning. I'm going to be discussing some of the history of the studio that worked on this movie, including some stories involving animal cruelty and sexual assault. If you're not down for that, feel free to dip out of the video now. For those who are sticking around, get ready because things are about to get dark. This film was produced by a company named Bonfire Legends, though originally it went under a different banner, Sinistate. A studio with a number of films under its belt, articles about them describe Sinistate as producing low-budget features for a more conservative audience, although the company's founder and owner, Dallas Saunier, resists that characterization, as he feels his movies are apolitical, which is what conservatives happen to want. Speaking to the Wall Street Journal, he said, If we can make a movie that does not treat them as losers, or ask how dare they vote a certain way, or pander to them, naturally they're going to respond in a positive way. Originally, Run, Hide, Fight was supposed to launch Sinistate's new Rebeller brand, though between the announcement of these plans in early 2020 and the present day in 2021, things radically changed. The major controversy to hit the studio was regarding one of its producers, Adam Donaghy. 
Donaghy joined Cinestate in 2017, working as a line producer and executive producer on the films The Standoff at Sparrow Creek, VFW, and Satanic Panic. He was also one of the executive producers on Run, Hide, Fight before his name was taken off the film a few months before its premiere. In late April of 2020, Donaghy was arrested for the sexual assault of a 16-year-old girl. Following this revelation, a number of allegations regarding sexual harassment became known to the wider public, revealing that this was a well-known secret within the local Dallas film scene. One of them included a conversation recorded by Kristen Leah Haynes from 2014, where she was working in the art department of the film Occupy Texas. At the time, she was 21 years old. In the recording, we can hear Donaghy proposition Haynes asking to see her underwear and then asking for her to participate in sexual acts. The recording and Donaghy's reputation were spread throughout the local film community. There are multiple stories of him aggressively touching or propositioning women on film sets, and he rarely seemed to face much in the way of consequences. The problem with Donaghy was that he was a line producer, meaning he was in charge of budgeting for the film. He also, in many cases, served as a source of financing for films. He was literally writing the checks of his would-be accusers. And in cases where his actions were brought up to others, they were often minimized or dismissed. In 2017, Dallas Sonnier and Amanda Presmick began partnering with Donaghy. In an article by the Daily Beast, ten people claimed to have directly reached out to the heads of Cinestate, Dallas Sonnier and Amanda Presmick, with four of them offering the audio that Haynes have recorded. Each of these people who approached Sonia and Presmik said that their reports fell on deaf ears. Both the producers claimed to have never heard the recording, and Sonia admonished Haynes for not making her report through official channels. When asked about the allegations against his studio, Sonia said he was largely unaware of them. Sonia told the Daily Beast, We're under siege right now. Everyone involved has their own personal vendettas against us. They have a history of harassing us and having problems with us. It feels like a targeted hit, and it feels like an attack. I think people have real issues with us. They have issues with our success, with the amount of movies we've made, and in a short time built this company to be something very special. It feels partisan. When the allegations went public in mid-2020, two of the publications Cinestate owned, Fangoria and Birth Movies Death, parted ways with the company. In an interview with Kyle Rankin, the writer and director of Run, Hide, Fight, he responded to learning about the Donaghy situation, saying, I was blown away. When the news broke, it was sad and shocking. I believed Cinestate that they didn't know about Adam's past and that they were working hard to restructure their company and have very safe sets. I knew that I ran a very safe set. I knew my side of the street was clean. I thought I could stick around and affect some change. Though there are no direct allegations of sexual harassment on the set of the movie, concerns surrounding the production have been raised. Speaking to the Daily Beast, the film's second assistant director, Kristen Leah Haynes, the woman who recorded Donaghy sexually harassing her, said she joined the production as a favor to a friend and because she needed the work. She said, There was some really sketchy shit going on on that movie. Haynes, who was only on set a few days, was also assured that she would be kept far from Donaghy. Several of the staff walked off the set of the movie, including the first assistant director, Meg Beatty, and key hair and makeup artist, Madeline Rose. In Rose's case, she mentions the reason for her departure had to do with the film's opening scene, where we see Zoe and her father hunting a deer. What bothered Rose about this scene was that this was no special effect. This was a very real deer that was shot on camera for the movie. She describes it. They hired a local hunter, went on his land, and filmed the deer being shot. Then they took the deer and froze it so they could pull it out again for close-ups with the actual actors. In the Daily Beast article, Sonia claims it was the legal harvest of a registered buck, and that SAG-AFTRA took no issue with the incident. Rose voiced her concerns over the deer to Donaghy, and she describes the encounter saying, He went off on me in a very condescending way. He got very heated and told me I was either with them or against them. Rose, who had been unfamiliar with the earlier allegations against Donaghy, quit the film the following day. Although the deer incident was unknown to the Daily Wire crew when they purchased the rights to distribute this movie, Jeremy Boring did speak to knowing about the incidents regarding Donaghy, having read the earlier Daily Beast article describing the history of sexual harassment and assault on sets Donaghy had worked on. Boring said, To the extent that things may have taken place in the production of this film or another film, I don't think it's my business. In the same way, it's not my business if something takes place at any other kind of company that I buy product from. I'm sure there have been allegations of sexual harassment at almost every major product company in the country. That doesn't mean the product itself has to be banned. Those things, to the extent that anything did happen, 
didn't happen under my watch. The Daily Wire's first foray into the world of entertainment is to ensure that the North American audience will get the chance to see a movie that would have likely gone straight to video on demand, only instead of appearing on Stars or Hulu, Run, Hide, Fight is on the same streaming platform as video podcasts of Ben Shapiro complaining about the Babysitter's Club show on Netflix. If it's from the Babysitter's Club. This is a show for kids, right? Young girl lecturing a doctor on how to, on, on misgendering people. Okay, well, here's the thing. They better hope, uh, Bailey was in the hospital for a fever here. They better damn well hope that, baby ain't in the, uh, that, that Bailey ain't in the hospital for testicular torsion. And that seems like the perfect place for this movie. I'm honestly surprised at how much I had to say about this movie. When I watched it, it was surprisingly uninteresting. And when I watched it again the following day, I was amazed at how much I had forgotten. It's surprisingly unmemorable as a movie. Not even in a so bad it's amusing way, it's just sort of whatever. Your life will not have been enriched in any way for having watched it. One thing I didn't cover in the video were the horrible working conditions for a lot of its crew members often paid very low wage, and they were often asked to work very long hours. There was another incident where a uh, where an older actor was considered too expensive to replace when, after he sexually harassed some women in the makeup department, including trying to grope one of them. According to one of the people involved, Sonia's response was to suggest that uh, the women start using the buddy system to avoid being groped. There were other stories of people who hadn't gone on the record and that were tougher to source, but overall, they seem like a pretty shady company. In other words, a perfect fit for the Daily Wire. I want to thank all my lovely patrons and members whose names are scrolling up on the screen right here. If you'd like to become one of them, you can either head over to my Patreon or click the Join button and pledge $5. That'll get your name in the credits, early access to videos, and downloads for my theme songs. And if you'd like to help in a way, that doesn't cost you anything. You can like, comment, and subscribe. Also hit the bell. Why not? Thank you everyone for watching.